All right, hey everybody. I am here with Steve Gregg. Our car interviews, we're taking Steve to the airport. Steve is the radio host of The Narrow Path, and he also is an author. He wrote The Four Views of Revelation, which has been a huge resource to me, and also The Three Views of Health. So Steve, thanks for taking the time as we head out to the airport to connect with us today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for taking me to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Steve, you do a question and answer on your uh, radio show. What do you feel like are the three most common questions that you get that you've heard throughout the ages? Ages. <laughs> well, um, I think the most often question I've heard is that one. That is, which is the most often oh, question you're asked? Interesting. I get asked that a lot. But uh, as far as the questions that are asked on the air, um, it seems to me like a lot of people ask questions that don't have much practical value, but they're matters of curiosity. One of them that I hear a lot, I'm not sure if I could find three, but uh, one that I hear a lot, maybe more than others, is uh, people call, always wondering about the Nephilim, who are the <laughs> Nephilim, who are the sons of God that married the daughters of men, and I, th I don't know why that's so interesting. <laughs> I can see why someone reading through, I think it may be that people who decide, I'm going to read through the Bible. They don't read very far before they get to Genesis <laughs> chapter 6 and, they, and they're scratching their heads over that. So, I mean, I, that might be why so many people ask it is that a lot of people don't read far enough into the Bible hmm. to have more <laughs> profound questions about later passages. Right. But um, that's a very common one. And a lot of times the questions are about things like that, which uh, if we had the answer, it would not make our lives any richer or any holier or any make our discipleship any more profound hmm. but they're just matters they're what I would call matters of curiosity whereas hmm. there's all many other issues I think people should be asking about that are matters of practical discipleship hmm. um, but but I don't object to people asking matters of curiosity because I have curiosity also I've, I, uh, I've been reading the Bible since I was young and I remember very well the, those kinds of questions that I would have you know so I'm sympathetic with the curiosity. It's just that I, uh, I, I consider those kinds of questions to be of a lower importance than mm. another kind of questions. Right, right. You often get asked questions, so is there a topic that you feel like you really want to passionately speak about instead of answering other people's questions? Is there something that you would love to share about? Well, my, my whole ministry for many years has focused on the one thing that Jesus focused on, and that was the kingdom of God. And um, it's an interesting thing because I don't think very many students of the Gospels would deny that Jesus' main emphasis in his parables and all his teaching was the kingdom of God. His gospel was the gospel of the kingdom. He said the disciples should seek first the kingdom, uh, that we should pray, your kingdom come. You know, that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world. I mean, there's, it's like the kingdom of God is from the beginning, the first time Jesus opens his mouth in the, in the gospel of Mark, he says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, therefore, and believe the gospel. The last time we read of Paul opening his mouth in Acts chapter 28, he's talking to people about the kingdom of God, it says, in the closing verses of Acts. So it's like that's, that's the main theme, and yet I find that many evangelicals like myself, I was raised an evangelical are, are brought up reading about, reading the words but not having any concept of what the kingdom of God is and I think a lot of people like are like I was when I was growing up I, uh, the church I was in never made it clear what the kingdom of God is so when I encountered it, you know what my church seemed to give the impression was that the gospel is about going to heaven when you die. Of course, Jesus almost never mentioned going to heaven when you die. Mm. Uh, there's, I'm not saying it was totally absent from his teaching, but you have to comb through pretty carefully to find anything that Jesus said about the afterlife. It was not his focus. It was not his emphasis. What he was concerned about was something that was at hand, mm. something that was, had drawn near, something that had overcome you, had overtaken you. It was in your midst, he said, the kingdom of God. So... Uh, you know, but my church always gave the impression the gospel is about getting your ticket to the afterlife. Mm. Uh, and so, with that assumption in mind, seeing that Jesus always talked about the kingdom of God, I, I guess I just 
by default assume the kingdom of God has something to do with the afterlife. It must be heaven as opposed to hell. And uh, of course, it wasn't until I became a, a more, I guess, mature student of the Bible that I realized that the things Jesus said about the kingdom of God can't apply in many cases to the afterlife. You know, in what way is the afterlife like a mustard seed that grows into a great plant? Or like leaven that's put into a lump of dough, you know? Uh, you know, this the kingdom of God Jesus described is not, he's not describing heavenly realities, he's describing something here. In fact, our prayer is to be your kingdom come. Not may I go to your kingdom, but may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So. You know, it is, I discovered that many years ago, and it was a revolutionary change in my understanding of just reading the teachings of Jesus. I realized there was something called the kingdom of God that was being anticipated by the Jews before Jesus arrived. That's why he said the time is fulfilled. The very statement suggests they've been anticipating something. They've been waiting for something. This is the time that, that you've been waiting for. The kingdom of God is near. So I had to ask, well, what were the Jews waiting for? What did the prophets predict? And of course, it was that the Messiah would come and he'd set up a righteous kingdom of justice and peace and uh, rejoicing. And uh, the Old Testament prophets who spoke of this never really mentioned the afterlife in any of their prophecies. Um, but they were talking about what God would establish in Israel. And that's why even after Jesus' entire ministry on earth was over, and he was asked by his disciples, the, the last question they asked him was, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Again, the kingdom, they weren't thinking of it as something in another world, they're thinking of it in Israel. Mm. Uh, Israel's here in this world, you know, you know, it's an earthly nation, and the kingdom was to be an earthly phenomenon, but not, not of this earth. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not from here, it's from heaven. It's the kingdom from heaven, the kingdom from God. And uh, yet it's, its location is here. And, and so, in other words, I began to realize that what Jesus taught has very practical ramifications for my life in this world. Mm. It has practical ramifications for the next life too, because if I enter into his kingdom now, you enter, in, uh, you enter into a kingdom that's forever. So it doesn't end when you die. It goes on forever and ever after you die too. But nonetheless, you enter it now or you won't be in it later. Mm. Uh, so Jesus said you have to enter the kingdom of God like a little child. So you enter it, and then, you know, you live it. You live in the kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom of God? Well, that was defined in the Old Testament, and it's not defined otherwise in the New Testament. And that is, it is Israel was told by God, if you will obey my voice, if you'll keep my covenant, you will be my kingdom, or the kingdom, you'll be the kingdom of God. And that's the first time in the Bible, that's, that's Exodus 19, 5 and 6. It's the first time in the Bible God mentioned having a kingdom or wanting a kingdom or having an interest in a kingdom. And he said, Israel, you could be my kingdom. What do you have to do? You have to obey me. You have to keep my covenant. And then you'll be my kingdom in the midst of the earth. There are other kingdoms. The devil has his kingdoms. God wanted to have his kingdom. And Israel was that kingdom. They were a holy nation kingdom under God and uh, and that's what Jesus established too <laughs> what Jesus established is he did it with the remnant of Israel the remnant of Israel were his disciples the, the Jews who believed and were faithful and uh, that number grew to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost and more than that every day afterwards. Eventually they began to include uh, Gentiles in the group. And we call that really the church, but, but the point is the church is not uh, 
a building with a steeple on it where people go on Sunday to conduct certain rituals of worship. The church is the community of disciples of Jesus. Mm. You enter the church, you enter Christianity by professing that Jesus is your King and your Lord. And the gospel that is preached to the world is that there's another King, one Jesus. That there, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Mm. Messiah means King. So, uh, this is the message that there's a King and that all men everywhere are commanded to obey him. That's why Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Well, all authority in heaven and earth includes, he's got authority over everyone. Mm. He's the king over everyone. But he said, therefore, go and make disciples of other nations and teach them to observe everything I commanded you. So in other words, bring them into submission to me, bring them under my teaching, teach them to do what I commanded. This is the church's mission. And yet, because the kingdom of God has never well, I shouldn't say has never been well understood, it has not in my lifetime been well preached in the evangelical Western world. We always think it's about heaven. And so basically we preach a gospel about how can you go, make sure you go to heaven. I, I hear it all the time. Other radio preachers say it all the time. They say, you know, what? if you die and face God and he asks you, what, you know, why should I let you into my heaven? What will you say? And they think that the answer to that question is what the gospel is. Why should God let you into heaven? Well, that's no doubt a very important question. But that's not the question Jesus asked. It's not the question that anyone asked in the Bible. The Bible never asks or answers questions about going to heaven. The Bible talks about embracing Christ as your king and living under his authority, living as if he is the king and as if you're a subject of his. So that's total shift in focus um, but it's the biblical focus and, and no one who reads the Gospels can deny this really I mean once you see it you can't not see it anymore okay. until you see it you cannot see it uh, but it's to me I mean I teach the whole Bible I teach every book of the Bible but because there's one thread that runs through the whole Bible, certainly from Abraham on, we could say from the Garden of Eden on, through today until the end of the world and beyond the end of the world, that theme is the kingdom of God. That's, that's uh, everything I teach is related to that in one way or another. Hmm. That's awesome. We're, uh, we got to talk a little bit last night just about the, we're almost at the airport, so we'll keep this short, but we got to talk last night a little bit about the magicalness of the Jesus movement in the 70s, and do you feel like the kingdom of God was greater, or was were you experiencing it more during that, that time than now? Well, I certainly did, and, and I know the, the thousands of others of Jesus people that were, that I was in fellowship with seemed to be. I always assumed they had the same experience I did. Of course, the Jesus movement, you know, the, the message that God let people say was kind of your typical evangelical American message that, you know, you'll go to heaven. And then there was this added thing, like the rapture's going to happen any minute. So not only will accepting Christ uh, get you to heaven eventually, but accepting Christ is what you need to do to avoid the tribulation, which, uh, you know, any minute you may miss the boat if you don't receive him today. That, that kind of preaching... Uh, to my mind, could be improved on. Nonetheless, lots of people did turn to Christ at that time, and many of them had stuck. I would say that of the many thousands of people who went to the church I was going to, who were converts, uh, maybe maybe a 50% have stick, stuck with it, and they're serving God in a big way. And uh, another, I'm, I'm just making these statistics up just intuitively from the, the people I think of who I knew. Sure. Maybe another 50% uh, fell away, but they were perhaps not really converted. Uh, a lot of times people just got on the bandwagon because they did think the rapture was coming soon and, and they didn't want to be in the tribulation. So they thought, well, I'll, I'll get that ticket punched, you know. <laughs> and uh, But then after decades go by, <laughs> they say, well, maybe the rapture isn't happening so soon. Maybe I should be out. Maybe I stopped partying too early, you know. Maybe I stopped... You know, seeking my own pleasure too early and, and a lot of people I think didn't really have a real commitment to Christ as king 
they had still the commitment to themselves and they were actually accepting Christ, so to speak, as another way of benefiting themselves. And when it began to seem like they're not really, like they're missing out on something and they're not benefiting themselves, they just ditched it. But those who came to Christ on proper terms came on his terms, not their own. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus said you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. And denying yourself means you're not coming for you, mm -hmm. you're coming for him. That's awesome. Well, Steve, we're here at the airport. So right. thank you so much. And check out. This is the Inner Island Terminal? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, check out Steve at thenarrowpath.com and you can get both of his books on Amazon and I'll put some links to that in the comments. Thanks, guys.